Welcome to a very special episode of the Munich I'm Show featuring Lenny. It's a it's a huge day, Dominique. It's it November is. 5th as of this oh, recording. Yeah. The NFL trade deadline. Yeah. Nothing else is happening in the world today. I hope people are standing in the poll lines listening to this podcast. That is my <laughs> dream for you guys if you haven't already voted. Please go vote if you haven't. Um Probably more crazy trades will break before or after we are finished taping this, but there have been a couple. We're going to talk about Monday Night Football. We're going to talk about some winners and woofs, but I did want to get your thoughts on a trade that came across uh, right before we started taping because this is a sizable one, and uh, it's actually ties to a team we're going to talk about at the end, which is the selling team, the New Orleans Saints, who traded Marshawn Lattimore uh, to the Washington Commanders They are throwing in a fifth in return. They're getting a third and then a fourth and a sixth. So, you know, kind of nets out to like a third plus. Um, It feels like the end of an era of Saints football, and we're going to discuss that at the end. From the commander side, though, obviously the signals that they are they are very firmly committed to winning the division as they should be. How do you like this fit in terms of for the team, the player and what it does for Washington? Yeah, I mean, they are in a situation where a veteran, accomplished, respected, standard level cornerback is something that could help them. Um, Marshawn Lattimore, and I got to be completely honest, I haven't been watching a lot of Saints this year, so I'm not sure like the version of Marshawn Lattimore they're getting, but I don't feel like it's peak Marshawn Lattimore, but yeah. he's still a good player. So I think there's some something to be said for a guy that you can trust to go out there and not completely blow it. So that is an upgrade and a guy who has playoff experience and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a reasonable trade for them. And, and he's a I wouldn't I don't want to say long term, but he is an answer that can be around for a few seasons. Yeah. He may not be like 10 years, but he can give you three Oh, he's got years. he's got contract years left at a pretty decent amount of money. So there's possibly a restructure in the works. But yeah, this is not a one year rental right. scenario. To your point, um, so Lattimore's dealt with injuries, obviously, and that's obvi- you know diminished his um, performance over the last few years. But I, I still think he's a good corner as someone who has watched the Saints. Um, he has not been uh, the responsible for some of the more comical Saints bust this season it's usually been other cornerbacks is the perhaps the best compliment that i can pay him uh i think for washington i pulled this up out of curiosity they still play a lot of man coverage which is something i think we expected with dan quinn but they're not good at it uh in fact they've been much better in zone coverage this year they're 11th in qbr when they play zone 21st in man so it seems uh pretty obvious that you know they're gonna i don't know if they'll play more man but they want to improve their ability to play man coverage and Lattimore certainly is an upgrade in that regard yeah Lattimore's, and i, I to be clear i'm not just pulling this out of my <laughs> i watched the saints i just haven't watched the yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lattimore's, yeah sorry, I mean, uh, specifically oh yeah i know i mean we go back long enough to know that i you're not trying to disrespect me but i don't want your listeners <laughs> think i'm just pulling it out of my I'm just saying I don't think of Marshawn Lattimore as top of the league corner as I think he once was. And I I don't believe that he's returned back to that form. But he is comfortable in man coverage. He's always been someone who is a bit more aggressive than I think his speed should allow him to be, if that makes any sense. As far as um, challenge, is that face about my analysis or does someone else just get trained? Oh, that's what I thought. Yeah, you know I, was gonna say, I didn't think I said anything that interesting, but yeah, what's the other trade? <laughs> Mike Williams to oh, okay. the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh. That's interesting. I mean, so the Steelers, we knew were in the market for a receiver. This had been, they'd been tied to a number of names. Um, it's funny because there's definitely some similarities to George Pickens. Mm. Uh, but hey, go all in on Russ Ball. Just yeah. throw it down the sidelines, man. I, I, yeah, sure, right? Like, I, I mean, it, I imagine it's not a whole bunch of compensation. A lot of these trades are like, yeah, sure, go ahead, why right. not? It kind of reminds me of the Ravens trade from last week, where it was like, okay, sure, why not? Like, I don't think that this is yeah. like a dire need, or it doesn't add a dimension that you didn't have. But like, we all know football is a game of attrition, and having more people that can play that you can trust is better than have fewer, having fewer. Um, we're gonna talk about the Zaria Smith trade later which is the other big trade. This feels actually like a good way to talk about a trade that has already proven to be very meaningful, and that's DeAndre Hopkins to the Kansas City Chiefs. 
that's not yeah sure <laughs> watching them last night i was thinking not only did he fill like a massive area of need but uh, he looked really damn good man and uh okay so let's talk about monday night football before we get to the Chiefs side of things and how the offense look i i, I wanted to talk to you about how the game ended because that's sort of the hot topic i guess coming out of this uh so um the Chiefs ended up winning, but before so, obviously, they go to overtime. Uh, the Bucks lead a triumphant two-minute drill. Excellent, really. Yeah. Baker Mayfield in the second half, I thought, was really good. Yeah, without and his big then weapons. I want to just kind of revisit exactly how this went down. Uh, Todd Bowles calls a timeout with about 30 seconds left, if I remember correctly. So he calls that timeout, and Dominique, my mind immediately goes to, oh, he's not going for two, right? Because if you're going to go for two, you don't call the timeout because you want to bleed clock to the end of the game. They score. He does not go for two. They kick the extra point. So let me ask you this. Um, are you as mad as the entire world is that he did not go for two in that moment? And do you think the entire world would have supported him if he had gone for two and not made it? <laughs> I honestly think this is the rare situation where most people would have supported him yeah. even if he lost going for two. I agree. Um, the funny thing is this morning I came in ready for all of this and to push back and Jeff, fortunately Jeff was the lone person that was willing to be my, I guess he's not a straw man because he's an actual man who believed that you should have kicked your extra point. But it was funny because the analytics by one percentage point yeah. was on Jeff's side. And then trying to get into the reasons why, I think the best, fortunately I've worked through this a number of times on a number of shows now I think I have it distilled down to the clearest way to put it is there are three paths to go down at that point one path is you gain you try to gain two yards and you win or you lose and then the press conference afterwards to me is fairly easy to handle the decision is easy um, then there's the other path where you kick the extra point and in that path there's two different scenarios is one you have to stop Patrick Mahomes from scoring but the better scenario, the one that you actually want, is you have to, again, take Baker Mayfield and this offense with all its top two receivers and march down the field and score a touchdown against quite possibly the best defense in football. And you give me those three options, it seems clear to me that win or lose, the way that I would want to go out is trying to get that two-point conversion. Yeah, I, I'm with you, and I actually agree. I think in most cases – the football media and football fans are very results oriented, except for yeah. unlike process. I mean, you know, there's litany of examples from this very weekend, right? But this is one where I think because of the quarterback on the other side, you do hear more often than not, dude, it's Patrick Mahomes. Just take it, take it, right. win. Do not let him back on the field. And I, I agree with you. I think they would have supported it. I think for Bulls, like you could make an argument against it if maybe you feel not super confident in your goal line offense, you're missing both your top wide receivers, your run game is just okay, Chiefs goal line defense is intimidating. So I guess that is something I would consider. And I guess you could also argue, like it's 50-50 shot, we might get the ball, and I just watched my offense go down the field uh, against a pretty gassed Chiefs defense. I think it's also notable. However, if you trust your offense to go down the field, you should trust them to pick up you know, right. uh, the defense, if they're gassed, there, so. if they're going to be gassed after halftime, they're pretty gassed right now after you just drove down the field on them. So, yeah, it's I, I like to on my show, I like to do a challenge where I say make it make sense, where I force myself to be on the other side of the argument and make it make sense. I'm having a hard time to make this one make sense because it even lines up with all of our fate or with some of our favorite sports cliches. Like if you are the road team. You shoot the three, not the two, to close the game. Like these are things that we've always kind of talked about. If you are the less talented team, the thing is, you give yourself a, in my view at least, you give yourself a better chance to win because there are fewer plays. Like you want to have fewer plays. It's just like uh, from a strategy standpoint, you want to run the ball if you're trying to have an upset. You want to have fewer plays because the more plays you have, the more chance it is for them to be better than you because they are. So I don't it's hard to make this one make sense. And then Todd Bowles justification had something to do with the weather, which I didn't quite understand what that how that played into it. It's like you think 
Well, I guess he just watched Patrick Mahomes almost throw them two interceptions. Oh, yeah. I don't know. No, I'm just guessing here. I don't know. Um, It'll be interesting. It's interesting to imagine this exact scenario, Dominique, if it was in the playoffs. And you know you get a chance, right? Because in the playoffs, the new overtime rules kick in. Then the calculus changes a little bit and gets very complicated. No, I, 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 you know, it's it's different. It's different. So, no, no, no. I, I get what you're saying. The yeah. scenarios do change in the playoffs. However, if it's, we're dealing with these two teams, right. what exactly. doesn't change to me yeah. is like, yeah. The other thing I is, like, I mean, you've got over. Chris Jones on the other side, who's like the right. ultimate closer, who like always seems to, I mean, obviously, that in this game, Baker was getting it out so quickly. On those successful drives, I guess. I think just, Jeff yeah, Jeff sorry. made a point this morning that like I I laughed at, but was probably the most um, uh, reasonable maybe point is they ran their play like that was their two point play. They ran that to oh, get it, cool. and yeah. and I was like, I mean, to me, uh, I'm sure you have more than one play, but I'm guessing like that's the only thing that was new. Awesome. Like, yeah. I'm sure he has more than. Right. But that was the only, that was the, it was novel, I guess. I felt like it was worth presenting because it was like the first, well, it was someone saying something that I hadn't considered that like they came into this game thinking they had one short yardage goal line pass and they ran it. I think though, this is a good microcosm, this moment, this decision, the backlash for the, I don't want to say limitations. Limitations is the right word when it comes to Todd Bowles. He's a really good coach. This team has really outperformed expectations this year. But there was, I never thought he was going for two. It's Todd Bowles. Like, that, even before the timeout, he's inherently conservative. In game decision making has been an issue with him forever, honestly. And he's a defensive coach, and yeah. this is a bad defensive team. They have a good offense. What they did in this game in the second half offensively without Evans and Godwin against that defense is really goddamn impressive. He it almost feels like he's not coaching that team though. Does that make sense? Like he he's yeah. still sticking to that defensive coach identity. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And they, they've been a very defense centric team since he's been there. And you're right. He hasn't upgraded his um, operating system to match the hardware that he has mm. now as he mm. is still functioning with software that suggests that he got an awesome D line. And it's like, Hey, 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 that's, it's not where your, it's not where your talent is right now. It's a good analogy. I do love Kalaja Gansey. Whew. That guy's, that guy's fun. But yeah, the, the, the back end, the linebackers, just this team defense is just not good enough. And um, it's a bummer because I, you know, they, they, if they had Evans and Godwin, they, I would have stuck with them as the favorite to win the mm-hmm. NFC South. And like I said, I thought the offense was so impressive in this game. Um, some of the play calls, Lee and Cohen called versus the blitz and man coverage in particular. She's obviously played a lot of man coverage. Really, really good. I thought Baker, like, you know, some of those outbreakers he was hitting, ball was coming out so quick. He did a lot to mitigate their pressures. In the second half, um, the, Kate Otten's like a really good tight end. Like, I, I mean, the catch he made over the middle of the field where he held on the football, I was shocked. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just such a bummer. I don't know how it's going to happen. I guess this is a complete, uh, well, not complete non sequitur, but it just popped into my mind that I'm looking forward to, and I guess Trevor Lawrence is probably not going to be traded because his contract, but they'll get a new coach. But I'm good, looking forward to when Trevor Lawrence is in a simplified system and is allowed to like, because you see that there are guys who have talent. Like Baker is, is the reason why I thought of this is like Baker is a guy who has talent, who is finally having the production that we expect. Yeah. I got to think Cohen is going to be, if if they sustain this going to be one of the favorites as a head coaching candidate next year, again, especially doing this without Evans and Godwin is wild to me. Um, you know, Sterling Shepard. I mean, Ben Johnson. All these these people. These people. They need to. They need to call all. Or Jacksonville needs to line these guys up and get them down there soon. Sorry. Sorry. I mean, we all. We could pretend like is like Doug's going to yeah, be there next know, year. Is, foregone conclusion at this point. All right. On the flip side, 
I didn't expect to start with a Bucks focus over a Chiefs focus, but we're going to have a lot of opportunities to talk about the Chiefs this year, guys. All right. So uh, Kansas City Chiefs, uh, Patrick Mahomes goes 34 for 44. It's overtime. 290 yards, three touchdowns, uh, 11 for 14 on third down of note. Um, you know, the Chiefs offense is a meat grinder. They just, I mean, that drive they put together in the fourth quarter just, they took up it felt like the entire fourth quarter they're just they're just ruthlessly efficient bucks unsurprisingly played a lot of zone coverage travis kelsey got a million targets uh, against that it's interesting the chiefs didn't really run the ball well in the first half but they stuck with it in the second half uh the run game looked better i want to talk about deandre hopkins though because like we knew all this about the chiefs offense we know obviously i mean <laughs> god the throw that to patrick mahomes that he made uh in triple coverage to deandre hopkins was absolutely insane but let's let's focus on hop because when the Chiefs traded for Hopkins, my first thought was like, okay, he's not. I actually compared him more to Juju than Rashi Rice because I don't see him as like that yards after the catch guy. I think what you saw in this game was like he he is not a game breaker at this point in his career, but he solves the problems the Chiefs had. Right, um, red zone in particular that slant he caught at the goal line with his you know ageless hands that's like, like remember juju tip tip that for the interception if you like right um zone coverage six for seven for 80 yards versus zone coverage and by the way in red zone before this week the chiefs were 23rd in red zone touchdown percentage so hopkins scoring twice there it just like especially when he caught that ball in triple coverage i'm watching that and i'm thinking oh like mahomes hasn't had a dude he can trust make that catch and it's changed him as a quarterback, and this might actually make him a little bit more aggressive as a result. Yeah, uh, that's the thing that jumped out to me is trust. Like, it didn't take long, but it was like um, Hop's first big catch. He threw it up into triple coverage, something that he would not do with any of these guys, where it, he gave DeAndre Hopkins a chance, and DeAndre went and got it um, and made a play. Those are the type of plays that we haven't seen Patrick Mahomes even try unless it was like a must win situation in a long time. And that's encouraging. I think the funny thing is, uh, this is the best case scenario for Deandre Hopkins to show up. This is exactly what, if it worked out perfectly that I said, I thought it would look like, however, I didn't think it would work out perfectly. So like I, I'm both not surprised and kind of shocked to see how perfectly he fits into this offense in just his second game with the Chiefs and how comfortable Patrick Mahomes seems to be with him. And yeah, it just it, it's it feels like um, we have to give it a few weeks, but it feels like it's it's going to be time to reassess how good the Chiefs are and how good the Chiefs offense is because of this addition. What? No, no, I just like how good the how reassess how good the Chiefs are. They're eight. No. <laughs> right, I know, Mina, but let's be serious. <laughs> uh, I thought it was uh it was very like appropriate that they start with the bomb to worthy that he screws up out he's out of bounds, right? And it's it, it, it you know, worthy the first round draft pick who's been just very up and down, more downs than ups, honestly. He's a rookie receiver. I'm not writing him off, but it felt like, you know, Mahomes is like, yeah, all right, I'm just going to throw it to him. Like, you know, it was yeah. it was a great youth versus experience kind of meme-like moment over the course of the game. And I saw, speaking of memes, I saw some a joke. Somebody posted a video of, like, old Jerry Rice, old Dan Marino, and they were like, this is Mahomes, Hopkins, and Kelsey. <laughs> but guess what? That old man game works when you have the greatest quarterback of our generation. It, it just – it he's all they needed they didn't need right. a guy to take the top off the defense they didn't need right. to do like a massive trade they just needed competent reliable <laughs> receiver play and as you said that appears to be what they've gotten yeah and no, it, it's exciting and it's interesting to see how it's going to work out i think it'll continue to work um and maybe it'll even help uh worthy like progress yeah. because he he was bumped up i guess by default to their number one receiver and that's not what he is, at least not yet. So we'll see if he's just uh, – he can run those big plays. He can run the reverses and gadgets and stuff, and that might allow him to be as productive as he was in week one. Yeah, I'll be curious to see if defenses play more man coverage against them because Hop and Kelsey yeah. are so good against zone, you know, and yeah. Patrick's place faced the second most zone coverage in the NFL this year. Um 
I could see that changing a little bit. Actually, they have the Broncos this weekend. I'll talk about that game. I think that's going to be a interesting test of that because yeah, I would rather I would rather man up Hopkins yeah. than pardon me than um, play zone against him and Kelsey. Um, all right, so Chiefs move on to eight and zero. As I said, the Bucks. It's not over, but they do need Mike Evans back, and I would really like to see more aggression out of Todd Bowles, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, speaking of aggression, let's take a quick break, come back and, and talk about the lions and their big trade and why they're one of the winners of the week. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words, Caesar's rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app. It's an empire. All right, we're back. So the lions are my winner. Lions Chiefs. Are we barreling towards Lions Chiefs? <laughs> it feels like it. I saw Stephen A. had the Lions. I don't know why I'm yeah. mentioning this. Had yeah. the Lions over the Chiefs. It's funny, like okay. that. He's not the only one, and the Chiefs are yeah. no. I, I, it's close, but anyways, that's not what we're here to do. So the <laughs> Lions uh, did trade for Zadarius Smith. We we're asking for them to improve their pass rush. Um, very minimal trade they get mm. they gave up a fifth and a six get smith and a seventh that instantly is like all right whatever you know this is <laughs> yeah it, it, the conversation is so low that i think whatever yeah. they get out of him is a boon um Zedaria smith just to really quickly kind of talk about the player they're getting he has five sacks 27 pressures 20 hurries other than Aiden Hutchinson, there is not an edge rusher on the Lions roster who has more than eight pressures or seven hurries. So instantly, you know, provides production. However, his uh, pass rush win numbers and some of the underlying metrics are a little bit down from last year. Uh, what do you think about this trade and sort of what it does for the Lions defense? Yeah, obviously, I think we can't bring Aiden Hutchinson back, but I would have loved to have seen this move opposite Aiden Hutchinson. Um, Zadarius Smith isn't like top of the league, top, top pass rusher. Obviously you can't replace Aiden Hutchinson, but it doesn't change the fact that this is huge. This is hugely valuable for a team that's going to make a run in the playoff, a team that's going to have the lead in a lot of games and could use someone to help them on third down, put pressure on the passer and, um, take pressure off of their man coverage corners because that's what they're going to do a lot of. So this is, uh, a really impressive trade, especially given the compensation. Yeah, I think it'll also be notable in run defense. That was something I was watching them play Green Bay. They had a little bit of trouble setting the edge against the run. Um, the interior of the Lions defensive line, I thought yeah. was excellent in that game. Ali McNeil was awesome, right? There was a sequence against the Packers in the fourth quarter where he caused incompletions downfield on uh, consecutive downs with his pressures. And I, and I think, you know, the, it, it doesn't make them one of the best pass rushes in the NFL, but it gets them a lot closer to, I think not where they were before necessarily, but at least above average and the secondary is playing better as well, which I guess brings us to the lions overall and, and why they're the winner. Um, I, I wanted to highlight them because watching that game against the Packers, Dominique, I just, my overwhelming sense was these are teams at like two different stages. The Lions, it, and it's interesting because obviously the Packers had so much success against them last November and Thanksgiving, and but the Lions put looked like such a more mature team, which you know kind of know that about the Packers. Obviously, they're a very young squad, and I don't mean that just because Jordan Love, you know, threw that goofy interception but it was like a lot of things um yeah. there are two things so so in the game you know love you know he had his ups and downs and marcus compared him to a little bit to josh allen in this one and i thought that was a pretty apt comparison but he was also let down by his teammates they had five drops in this game the packers there was a ton of really some pretty bad ones i thought mm -hmm. so i'm um, i was thinking like dang <laughs> you know the Lions obviously didn't drop any footballs. I was thinking, how far back do I have to go for the Lions to even have five drops on the season? So I pulled up the game log and I was looking and I was looking and I was like, just not seeing any drops. So then I went to the season long stats. The Lions have one drop on the year. 
which is best in the NFL. The Packers have 20, which is the worst Gosh. in the NFL. And that's such a, like the contrast. Yeah, the other thing that I looked up, because the Packers had a ton of offensive penalties. So the, the, the Packers have the third most offensive penalties in football. The Lions have the fourth least. So setting aside all the stuff we love about the Lions, the trench play, the run game, the scheme, all of it, which we can talk about. I just thought, wow, those two stats really capture a big part of why one of these teams is viewed as the best in the NFC right now. And I'm not sure I'm trying, I'm doing cartwheels in my mind to try to connect these things to their run game and their offensive line. I'm not sure that these things can be directly connected, but they certainly seem consistent with the theme. Like when you said a mature group, like a, a big boy team, this is these are the things that you do. You run the ball when the other team, like against loaded boxes, they ran the ball well. You run the ball when the other team knows that you're going to run the ball and you're capable of closing out games that way. That's what a big boy team does. You don't make mistakes that kill yourself that kill you in um, bad situations. You're comfortable and confident being aggressive and fourth down situations or must have got to have it situations. You're like all of this stuff is like, to me, it's a very, I think mature is the right word. A very mature team. That's uh foundation is their offensive line. Yeah. And you know, I, I want to context for those drops is, you know, the Jordan loves pushing the ball down. I thought in this one, yeah. too many shots, too many shots against the blitz, tempting high de- level of difficulty throws. Whereas Jared Goff threw the ball over 10 yards twice in this game. Because he didn't have to, right? Like it wasn't, right. I'm not, that's not at all Jared Goff slander. They're, they're just doing what they have to do. I mean, the Packers, um, the three linebackers were on the field almost the entire game because they were so committed to trying to stop the run. So Ben Johnson, Jared Goff just went after them. I mean, how many times did you see Gibbs just catching a pass in the flat that went for like eight, nine, 10 yards? It's just, it's just clean football. I don't know what to say. Like they're just really, really good. They get defenses to do exactly what they want and they don't take unnecessary risks and yeah, they're just super complete. So love this trade for them. It was a really big performance. I'm not all out on the Packers. I still think that in the second half of the season, we're going to see a better version of this offense, but it's just been inconsistent thus far. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see a healthy, Oh, sorry. I was saying I'd like to see just a, a healthy stretch for Jordan love and this team would be nice, but my winner is, it's from a team that lost, but it's Drake May. Like, I think we've been seeing some clips and some, like, moments from Jake, Drake May that suggest, like, maybe maybe they got one. And I felt like this game was kind of the culmination in the moment and not even the, like, miraculous halfway fluky play at the end of the game but it was through the course of the game i think i I texted charlie at some point in the first half producer and co-host of my show um i think like yeah i i think i said something to the effect of they got one in new england because it's the combination of him playing in and outside of structure without all the support that that i normally think a young quarterback needs he just seems to be really good. Of course, he had a horrible decision on the fi- ending of the game interception, but I wasn't worried. And then just the way it looks also, the ball jumping off of his hand in a way and his athleticism, just top to bottom, like, yeah, you can build around this guy. Uh, this was from Next Gen Stats. Drake May has now the most scramble rushing guards back quarterback in the game this season. He had 95 yards in this one. Um, on the season... So I saw that and I was like, God, he, it's funny because we, he drew a lot of Josh Allen comps because of his mm. arm talent and maybe the aggression and, you know, he's a little bit raw, but I really, he really reminds me of Allen as a runner because he's gigantic mm. and fast and fearless and unbelievably efficient because of all of those things. In fact, uh, he only has, he has 21 carries. So, you know, fewer than obviously he didn't start for much of the season, but that's still a decent, um, sample size and at this point he leads all dual threat quarterbacks in success rate and epa per carry when he runs the ball the thing i also i I liked so first of all i I love that you highlight because the titans defense is good and i think that's important context here right this is a good i thought they would give him a ton of trouble the thing i really liked in seeing this too is just his the impact that his running scrambling and out of structure playmaking throwing he looks good throwing on the run the way defenses have to respect that, and you saw that over the course of the game, that's going to bear fruit over the course of the season and his, and over the course of his career, frankly. Yeah, I, I was really impressed. I, the numbers that you 
brought up to support his athleticism. It helps to put some context around how impressive it really was. And it seems like that's, we talk about the like high floor guys is their running ability. Like it seems like there's that to me buys him so much time and uh, to develop the rest of his game, which is already seemingly a little bit more developed than I anticipated, especially given how he was put in kind of the project category. I mean, not full project category, but he wasn't the way that we thought of Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels as guys that we expected to come right out and start right away. And he's doing it in the worst situation of any of the yep. three. I mean, holy smokes, Patrick Patriots offense sucks. I was watching yeah, this. That's, that's oh. the most impressive part Yeah, is that it feels like he's making it happen with guys. And then we have the comparison to what they were doing with Jacoby also, like how different this looks from week to week with just a new guy, not new talent, not a new offensive line, not a new genius play caller. We took out one guy and put in another guy. I kind of wish they would have traded. I mean, it's not trade deadline's not over. So maybe you'd be listening to this and they got someone, but I, there's so many plays where nobody's open and he's, that's yeah. part of why he's scrambling. It's not like he's bailing and I'm just, it's so frustrating to watch. And I think it's important to his development that they add pieces and they're probably going to wait yeah. until next season. But I really wish, you know, nobody thinks the Patriots are going to like, you know, go on a run this year, obviously, but it would be nice since, since obviously the season is about his development and he's shown flashes and that's really exciting. It would be nice if they found a way to assist in that development somehow. Yeah. I mean, you, you develop some habits in the early portion of your career and this tuck and run habit, you, you could see it becoming something that uh, is ingrained in him in part because the offensive line is not great. And even more important, the receivers are getting the separation that should make him feel comfortable. But I mean, it could also go the other way where he just learns how to rip it into tight windows all the time. <laughs> I don't understand this offense too, like what they're trying to accomplish. The it's it's they don't run the ball well. They don't play action well. I don't know. I mean, it's it's obviously hard because of the offensive line, but um, he is definitely overcoming. So Patriots fans probably going to be your last time on winners this this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a yeah. de development by fire strategy is what they're going with there. You know, there's no one, what, what did we say last week? There's no one right way to develop a quarterback. Speaking of my woof, Indianapolis Colts. Uh, woof, woof. Yeah. This could not have gone any worse for them. Yeah, in a uh, that, predictable um, Flacco's fashion. Flacco's the starter for the rest of the season. Yeah, I'm sorry. They said he's do, uh, starting next week against the Bills. Talk about that on the preview. Um, God. So you and I spent a quite a bit of time last week talking about like, you know, them making the change to Flacco, how we were both surprised that it was like a long-term commitment rather than a seeming short-term thing. Um, backfired in spectacular fashion. Is that over saying it? <laughs> I mean, how many interceptions is spectacular? Cause I, I don't know if I would say spectacular fashion. It definitely backfired in okay. an ugly fashion. Nothing will compare it to my all-time favorite backfire. Do you know what, what that is? Carolina? When they benched Cam Newton oh, for not wearing yeah. the tie, they put in Derek Anderson, and he threw an interception <laughs> on the very first play. Yeah, One of my yeah, favorite Cam moments in NFL history, to be honest. I think that was the yeah. Ron Rivera era. That was incredible. Yeah. Cam um, Newton was right bad. back in there. It, but it wasn't just bad. It was boring. That was the yeah. thing. The offense was so boring. And look, the – I posted after the game that this is their worst performance by the season of EPA per play and worst, you know, it's terrible running the football and early downs. It couldn't get anything going. And the context is important because the Minnesota Vikings defense is very good and they needed a get, get right game right after the last couple of weeks against uh, very good offenses. But uh, it was hard for me to watch this Colts offense with Flacco. And while I do think they're going to be better against bad defenses, the ceiling is so obviously capped. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, right. yeah. But the, yeah, the, this is definitely a candidate for make it make sense. Cause I don't quite understand the, and this is, has to be more going on. I'm assuming, yeah. and maybe I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't extend the benefit of the doubt to their front office and their decision makers. But like, it seems so obviously short-sighted that I'm assuming they know something that I don't know because what is the argument for having a like a capped is the word that you used but um the positive form of the cap is like it has a floor too so like 
I don't get the the reason to have an offense that can't be atrocious but can't be successful with a guy who is obviously not the long-term answer. It, it seems like, and there's interpersonal stuff that we don't know, and there's locker room dynamics, there's um, player development stuff that we don't know. But if you're just looking at, like we boil it down to video game logic, you're just looking at the guys on the field, this makes no sense. You need them out there to develop. You need them out there to give you a chance to win some of these games. You're not so talented that you just need like a game manager. And not that Joe Flacco ever has been like a true game manager. He's always kind of been a a bit of a boom or bust guy that wants to take deep shots down the field and be aggressive and sometimes turns the ball over. But like, I, I don't get the logic for having Joe Flacco as your backup in this situation. And I certainly don't get, get the logic for making him your long-term starter. I, yeah, the, the logic, I guess, was that the offense would look more, that the, that the floor would be raised and, you have the opportunity to develop guys and maybe like to your point, there's things with Richardson behind the scenes in terms of his development as well. Um, The result was that the floor actually went down because, uh, but again, competition matters. However, I, one thing I did think was very noteworthy in this game, you know, we spent so much time, not we, but like the world talking about Anthony Richardson's bad stats, right? The completion percentage and all of that. Yeah. I was watching this thinking, man, like this is a good illustration of how, um, when you have a dual threat quarterback, he impacts the game in ways that don't add to his stats, but help other people's stats. Uh, so Jonathan Taylor with mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson on the field, there's a number of ways you can look at this, but one I think that really captures how defenses play them was averaging 3.22 yards before carry, which is very good. That's like near the top of the NFL. In this game, it was 1.6, which is very bad. That's near the bottom of the NFL. So I, I want to be clear. I'm not painting with a broad brush. It's not always the case that a run game is infinitely better with a mobile quarterback. It's definitely the case with the Indianapolis Colts there because of the nature of their run game, which was so predicated on making defenses respect the numbers advantage that they had. You take that out, and boy, the Minnesota Vikings said, thanks, this is a lot easier for us. To my point, why is Joe Flacco your backup <laughs> in the first damn place? Yeah, none of a- this is congruent and, like – yeah, this is not the guy that you want to back up your quarterback. This is not the guy that you want to have the long-term answer. Um, I think you can go all the way back and maybe he shouldn't have started his first game last year. There's lots of issues, Anthony Richardson, that is. There's lots of issues with the way that they're trying to develop this very unique player. And when you have a player who is obviously a project, like I, I use the word project when we're talking about Drake May, this is entirely different level of project. There it's very delicate when you're doing something, you're trying to thread a needle, a fine needle where there's a bunch of talent, but it has not um, materialized into a bunch of on-field success yet. It's a very delicate way to develop a player like that and throwing him out on the field and then yanking him the next year. It just does It feels um, a bit haphazard. It's something you would do with a, a player that you don't have much faith in or a player that's older and more experienced and you're like, let's see how this works. It's not what you would do with a player like this in my view. Well, Joe Flacco next week, although I did look at the schedule and there's a really nice, hold on, let me pull this up moment. If they want to go back to Richardson, they could do Flacco through the lions game. And then after that you get the Patriots. Bron- oh wait, Broncos. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> Never mind. No. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you end with the, with the the Giants and the Jags. So week 17 and 18, triumphant return of Anthony Richardson, Giants and nice. the Jags, go crazy, Mo- carry that momentum into next year. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Did I right. miss it? I thought they, I mean, I guess they could, doesn't mean that they could change their mind, but I thought that there was something today, and maybe I misread it, that said that they said that Joe is the guy for the rest of the season. Is I that, just saw I mess that up? I saw against oh, the Bills. okay, cool, cool, cool. Maybe it's... He said that. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't mean they don't change it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Speaking of uh, things that are that are Jover, Saints. So let's just take a quick moment here to mourn the uh, Indianapolis or pardon, Indianapolis. Geez. The uh, this generation iteration of the New Orleans Saints. Somebody put up the 2017 draft. Holy crap! That's uh, unbelievable. Because you know, because Latimer, because Latimer trade and Ramchick, but also like. 
Trey Hendrickson was in that draft. My God. Um, absolutely ridiculous. What are, you, what are you calling this era? Because I feel like it, there's an argument that you could end it after Sean Payton left and started yeah. a new era. But honestly, it still feels like, I don't know, it's all still connected from the breeze all the way through it. They never quite felt like to me that there was a real moment of demarcation or it's just like, oh, maybe it's because Taysom Hill's been there for a long time. All of these like guys seem like, you may, does it make sense to you where it's like they hand it from one guy to the next guy? It never seemed like a real reset to me. Yeah, well, that's, it's a great point. That's why it's, this is the end of the era because it was dragged down for so long, right? Like this is, <laughs> and that's why training Ladmore feels like finally they had yeah. their come to Jesus yeah. moment. I, um, let yesterday on NFL live, when we talked about the firing of Dennis Allen, this was obviously before Lattimore was traded. Um, I forgot did Dan, Dan was like, yeah, they, you know, they kept kicking the can down the road. And they got me thinking, like, what it, what happens when you meet the can? <laughs> like, what is what is that exactly? like? You know, because so yeah. I, I I looked it up, and it's the expression. It says started around the 1980s or gained like popularity, but it was based on a game from the game Depression, where people would just where kids would just kick a can, and somebody would try to catch the can, which is the most depression <laughs> thing I've ever heard. <laughs> So this was a game in the 80s that was called yeah. Depression that was like no, about no. the Great Depression? No, no, no. The game is from the Great Depression. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is that is some depression. Oh, gosh. Y'all ain't had one ball in the whole neighborhood. Y'all ain't had one ball. What if you took away uh dex like game systems and just gave him a can oh, and said, go play kick can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean yeah yeah you you know my children well the, the the other children he is a unique child in that yeah he would find some way to make something that made me uncomfortable with that can something that concerned me he would at first he'd be pissed he'd be very angry but by the end of a couple hours that can would be turned into uh, some sort of explosive I used to take, so we didn't have a lot growing up, and I used to take, mm. we, I, we had all kinds of like janky, we didn't have game systems, we had all kinds of janky homemade yeah. toys, and I used to take two coffee cans, do you ever do this thing, and then I would put a piece of string, I would punch a hole, tie yeah. a piece of string, and then walk around on the coffee cans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We had a, a slightly better version of that with um, wood blocks. I don't know if it was uh, like, I was in like some... Boy Scouts or, or something like that, where we made something like that, and it was it was pretty cool. My little makeshift stilts, they were yeah. pretty dope. Oh, I don't know yeah. how many times I rolled my ankle, but it didn't matter back then. I healed immediately, but I definitely remember falling off of the a lot. <laughs> well, Nikki Loomis caught the can. The can is here. The can has arrived. Dennis Allen is out. Um, so I think, you know, we don't have to revisit everything that led to this. I think the question for Saints fans, we can just kind of nod to this is what do you do moving forward? Cause the Lattimore trade didn't save them a lot in cap, but clearly they want to amass draft picks so they can start to rebuild because they cannot afford to pay or acquire players over $60 million over the cap next year. They don't have contracts on their books that they can restructure because of the aforementioned can kicking. Never want to hear the cap's not real again. I never want to hear that, by the way. Um, ben Solek did a great piece today where he was kind of outlining some of the, their, you know, they probably want some of their guys like Ryan Ramchick to retire. But uh, I guess my question for you is like, if you're the Saints team, who do you build around? You know what I mean? Like, do you feel like, what are you thinking going into next year? Because obviously this is a rebuild time. Yeah. I, honestly, the question of who you build around is premature. Like, I don't <laughs> think they're at that stage right now. Like oh. the reason why, I mean, because we had, so we did a lot on the Cowboys today because they're the Cowboys. And also I actually think their situation is slightly more interesting. Sorry to yeah. change Topics, no, they actually, but, they have no. a core. They have a core. And they, right, right. Out. There's things they can and do. And so, yeah. like, yeah, there are things that we can do because the hardest, I would say, if you made a list of things you need to win a championship and you made, listed them from difficult to find and acquire to easy to find and acquire, you could go down the list of the top three things that the Cowboys have. And the only other thing I would put in there is, like, 
left tackle maybe, but they have a quarterback, they have a true number one, they have a dominant pass rusher. These are key ingredients to yeah. building, and, they, and they're all like, not young, but Dak's not young, but age-wise, he got, a, he got some time. CD's young, Micah's young. That's a different thing when you look at this roster. It's like anybody that I think is, yeah, like I'm thinking it, like the quarterback you don't have, Chris Olave would be your kind of true number one receiver, but he has um, the injury concerns and also hasn't been like like one of them dudes, but that could be also a quarterback. Like he's not at top, top of the league. So like I don't think they're in a position right now to be like, all right, who do we build around? I mean, maybe you have a better grip on this than me. Who do you see no, that's I worth doing? The roster, I mean, there's good young players. I th- I think a lot of yeah. very good. He's good. Um, the, you know, the Olave, offense. Yeah. No, I mean, a lobby's obviously very good, but, like, are you at all concerned about, like. Careful. Careful. Josh Olave is watching. Chris Olave is very <laughs> active brother online. I don't know if you have you seen oh, any yeah. of that. I haven't seen any of that. Is he? Um, he's the new oh, okay. Marcus. I mean, he's defense. He's defending. I mean, my point is. No, I know. I know. You. Yeah, building around someone who's had a number of easy. concussions is oh, is a okay, tough yeah. situation to do. Yeah, yeah that, and, I wasn't uh, saying that he was bad. I was just talking no, about like building around someone like that who may not be around. So yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I cut you off. You were in the middle of going down your no, list. No, of... it's, not, it's not a long list. I mean, right. you know, the guys you drafted this year, Fuanga and McKinstry, I think have flashed some. You you know, Fuanga is their offensive tackle. McKinstry is the corner. Um, yeah. Up front, Carl Granderson, Pete Werner. I mean, there's some good players. But, yeah, you, you need tent poles, most importantly, obviously. You need quarterback. I think that's going to be the biggest decision for this team is how you approach the quarterback position because obviously the draft is not, you know, a great quarterback draft. And also um, the team itself is not great. But you know what? We thought that about the commanders and they getting the quarterback dramatically accelerated their rebuild. So right. yeah, we'll but that's see. the thing is like that is that's a that's a lottery ticket. Man. <laughs> like, yeah. Come on. That's not that's not a rebuilding strategy. That's uh, like we got lucky. You can't plan to do that. And I'm looking I wasn't looking at their roster when you asked me before. I'm looking at their roster now. And like, yeah, uh, it's, it's well, not pretty of the guys that they have that I think are really good. Like many of them are very are, are a little bit older. And there also aren't a lot of guys on here that I think are really good. And my, 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 how far we are from week two. And we were like, hey, these guys are good. Look at them reinventing the offense. Just to kind of put a pin on that, the offense has excuses. The offense, in addition to losing Derek Carr, the interior of the offensive line, injuries, there's a reason why the offense, I think the reason why Dennis Allen there's just a lot of reasons why he doesn't have a job. He was like on our number one or two on our hot seat list, but whatever. But the defense really fell off without the same excuses, to be honest. And um, and defense, you know, they got old, they got slow, they're busting coverages, they're bad against the run. Dennis Allen was the defensive guy. So it, it, no one's surprised that he got fired. I think it's just kind of, now it turns to what do you do from the GM perspective? By the way, Mickey Loomis. Maybe it's, another. It's, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it's best. I mean, it, it, I feel like to be fair, you need to make Mickey stick around and um, ride out these <laughs> this um, this cap uh, restructuring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like he did this to the cap. You got to sit here and deal with this. You don't get to leave now. But um, yeah, that's that's the. Uh, yeah, it was probably time for somebody new. But yeah, I'm looking at this, and there's not one guy on here that I think of. And maybe it's because I'm fresh off the Cowboys conversation. But there's nobody on here that's a cornerstone like any of those three guys that I named that the Cowboys have. Well, sorry, Saints fans. Uh, I but you know what. The good news is you finally you're, eat, you're taking your medicine, right? Because there's a right. world in which they would have muddled along, been crappy again, and just kept this thing rolling. And I think it's funny. I, my friend Greg Rosenthal and I always talk about like the 
debate between like going for the Super Bowl versus just going for the division. And this is a team that's been going for the division for years. And now there's the opportunity to actually try to take a long view and to actually think bigger whether they'll take that opportunity is, you know, and, and who and whether they can accomplish it and who's in place to do it, obviously. But again, there's always examples around the NFL of teams that turn around with different people in charge. So this yeah. does New Orleans, So that's yeah. nice. Right. See it's <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's it for today. Um, I will see you guys on the other side on Thursday. <laughs> doing a preview oh, yeah. uh thank you as always to the great dominique foxworth you guys should check out his podcast oh, dominique foxworth yes, show i will be there also um on oh. friday yeah I sh- my show with you on friday yeah it'll be a really good show with yeah things might be different you need to in have the world. nick on to start recapping the Aaron hernandez show by the way, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I, is that allowed? I would love to. All right, I'm doing it. I'm going to text Nick right now. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know that you're. I don't know if your listeners know what we're talking about, but no, we're not I, talking about no, Nick Wright. <laughs> uh, yeah. Although I need to fight with Nick Wright about the. Well, I guess I don't feel as strongly about the Ravens being better than the Chiefs anymore. Not after D Hop. Yeah, oh, Chiefs looks terrifying. All right, bye guys. Whoa!